Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I have a background. Uh, um, sorry, um, start again. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, I'm from New Prosperity Devon. Um, I have a background in social and environmental change training and events, and I'm really excited to be with you here all tonight um, for this Devon Rural Housing Features event. Um, the event aims to inspire, support and catalyse action for community-led housing and other solutions to the skyrocketing prices and the lack of affordable homes and rented accommodation in Devon. This all occurs in the context of inflating energy prices, rising fuel poverty and an increase in homes used as holiday lets. And there's also a need for policy and action to ensure sustainable local supply chains um, and energy efficiency in new and existing buildings. So to set the context um, on some of the problems, let me share a few figures with you. The number of holiday lets in England has risen by 40% in three years, um, BBC analysis of uh, council figures suggests. Uh, the housing campaign group Generation Rent found that 3,000 new holiday and second homes were registered in the southwest of England during the pandemic. And tourist areas such as North Devon, which already have large numbers of holiday lets, have seen sharp increases. Um, there's also concern about the property prices that are pushing established residents out of out many areas. Um, Published today, data obtained by the BBC uh, from 152 individual councils across England on short-term lets, <clears throat> available for at least 140 days of the year in registered business rates rather than council tax, so that's only those that are registered, um, showed that North Devon had the highest number of holiday lets in England, rising from 1,319 in 2018 to 1,758 in 2011. Um, so some of us where I live in Teambridge uh, call neighbouring villages ghost towns in the winter due to the number of homes that lay empty with no lights on. In recent months, local councillors uh, call concern over the sharp rise of evictions during lockdown, with friends of associ and associates of mine reporting rental prices in the area rising sometimes by hundreds uh, of pounds, making finding a home close to family and support networks nearly impossible with often over 90 people trying for the same rental property. Homelessness, so surfing, living in temporary emergency B&B accommodation and living in tents is in danger of becoming the norm in 2022. And many believe that the national policy changes won't be enough, fast enough, for the problems of housing resilience in Nevin and beyond. And many of us are grateful that campaigns are being picked up by a national press that may encourage more urgent action. A quote from for the, um, for the BBC in an interview just this morning <clears throat> by Emma Hookway from a campaign group at North Devon and Torridge Housing Crisis said, there's a real fear in the area at the moment if you're renting. One of my friends the other day, she got a phone call from her estate agent and she felt like crying instantly. She thought, oh, that's it. It's going to be sold. It's going to be converted into a second home or holiday let. A shocking figure from housing charity Shelter said that 274,000 people were homeless in England last year. This is unacceptable. That said, with all this going on, there is much to celebrate about community-led solutions to, that, to this crisis, which I'm very pleased to be um, sharing some speakers today um, who will be uh, coming on shortly. That <clears throat> But before that, I'll hand over to my colleague Jill for a little more context and some housekeeping. Hi, uh, my name is Jill Westcott. I'm from NPD and I'm the secretary of Cheriton Bishop Community Land Trust. Um, I'm also on the Net Zero Task Force, which is responsible to the Devon Climate Emergency Response Group to write a Devon Carbon Plan. And that's also something which is concerned with housing because um, it contains actions to try and bring net zero housing forward, um, both for the retrofit of existing homes, making them less cold um, and with lower bills and also for new houses. So we've been looking at how local councils, if they change their local plan, they can also add supplementary guidance to give themselves power to 
uh, use net zero as a criterion for what they give planning permission for. And I hope, James, you're going to say a bit more about things like that. So just to start off with, um, it'd be really helpful to know roughly who's in the room, what sort of group we are. And um, please feel free to introduce yourself individually in the chat. But Roxy's also going to put up a poll um, about who we are. Is that ready, Roxy? If you like to just chip, you, you can tick more than one. Uh, so the general outline of the workshop is that we're going to hear from five speakers, very quick introductory things so that you know what they're here about. And I'm looking forward to that. We'll have some questions and answers. And then we'll have uh, another two contributions with questions and answers. And we'll have a break, uh, a comfort break at around 7.50. Then when we come back, we will have a breakout group and you'll be able to select which speakers you um, want to go and have further conversation with. After 15 minutes, there'll be an opportunity if you want to, to move to a different breakout group or you can just stay with the one that you're in. Then after that, Roxy's going to introduce a visioning exercise and we'll have a further breakout session in small groups just to share um, that about what we see as possible and desirable for the future, what might, might happen. So we'll end with sharing our uh, calls for action, our ideas and um, our visions. So I hope that's okay. Roxy, do you, is it time um, that we can see the results of the polls or do you need more time for that? Ah, great. You should be able to see that now. Yeah. Great, we've got a fair spread of um, different sorts of participants. So uh, I would also suggest that in this session, we might use Chatham House rules. That means it's fine to talk about um, what happened once we get outside of the session and who and what we talked about, but just not to relay um, individual stories about this person, this organization, um, because that will enable people to share things that might not be, um, they might not want discussed in general public things. So please do share the learnings, but not with identified speak, um, institutions or individuals. Um, so that, with that, I shall um, move to some of our speakers. And um, we're very pleased to have with us um, the panel. And I, we'll start with Kay Korf. Kay is a Biddeford Town Councillor and um, she's been a campaigner on empty homes. She, um, Kay, I'm sure you will tell us more about yourself and what you've been doing. So I'll hand over to you now at this point. Hi, thank you, Jill. I'm just going to start my stopwatch as well, because I could talk about this topic further than a day. So before we start the slides, I'll quickly tell you a bit more about me. So my name's Kay, I'm nearly 39. I live in Biddeford in Torridge, Northern Devon. I've got two children, two dogs, two hamsters and a husband. Um, my whole adult life and late teenage years have been embedded and entrenched at fighting for the rights for people that have got housing issues that are homeless. It comes from a personal place of being street homeless at the age of 16, and then statutory homeless with children eight years ago. I work for a local charity. 
I'm on the front line with an amazing crew on a daily basis, today included, fighting for the rights, protection and um, opportunities for people from all walks of life that are in supported accommodation or currently homeless. And I'm going to be really honest with you guys. I am I am not here today to cause trouble, but in general, I am causing trouble, positive trouble, because I feel like a lot of us are sounded out, our voices. Um, the town council that I'm on, Biddeford Town Council, did agree and did declare a housing emergency. Torridge District Council wouldn't, because why would it affect change? And it would affect change, because many people in a homelessness or housing issues difficult situation the first thing that they need and want and deserve is recognition and to be seen and to be heard and that's the main reason I'm here so I'm going to start with some slides because this is a topic that makes me angry sad empowered all in one and I think showing these slides will sort of help you so this is me James is mom Ruth and my daughter May this is outside Biddeford Town Council a few weeks ago. Um, we have started a working group finding empty homes with the, with the late of you to getting empty homes back into use for people that haven't got somewhere to live. Next slide, please. This is me wearing my favourite band t-shirt. We put up the borders that board us into our boxes. And this is one of the most powerful things powerful statements I've ever heard because we're constantly told there's not a magic money pit you know the solutions aren't available right now we can't change things oh yes we can next slide please this is a community Christmas dinner in Biddeford that we did last Christmas this is a very small part of our crew not my crew our crew this was providing a, a Christmas for people that anyone that needed, but the majority of attendees were people that are isolated, they're judged, they're looked down on, they don't deserve to have a Christmas, and they bloody do. And it was absolutely wonderful. Next slide, please. <laughs> I ate Christmas, but I walk with Santa every year to raise money with the rota with the round table clubs to distribute to people with housing with housing difficulties and that make that are homeless. Um, I have to do things that I don't want to do to raise this money, but I'm fully willing to do that. And that is a kind of a smile, but that Santa Claus is really cool. Next slide, please. Oh, I love this. Can you show my face as well on it? So this is my T-shirt that says Eat the Patriarchy. And I was in a town council meeting wearing this, talking about the housing crisis. And I took a picture of myself and... This is me causing trouble to get what we need in terms of housing. Next slide, please. This is me gobbing off a uh, uh, march for the midwives. There's a huge percentage of midwives and nurses in general that are facing homelessness, regardless of the amazing work that they do. So we got involved in that as well. Next slide, please. I know I haven't got long, sorry. This is me. I grew a daughter called May. Um, she, she does things with the community. She's experienced statutory homeless as well. Um, and she's absolutely amazing. And she's part of the campaign. Next slide, please. This is another child that I grew, helping to grow other children. His name's Toby. He's also part of the homelessness campaign and has experienced statutory homelessness. Next slide, sorry. This is the last slide. This is me, clean hair, had a wash under the armpits and everything, wearing my council, K Corp councillor, the Biddeford Town Council. I hate wearing that badge. It's an utter privilege to wear it, but I don't want to label myself I'm the same as everybody else. But I thought this picture was important because it lets me give you the title of this whole talk. Because what we have to do and what I'm doing is conforming to not conform. And my whole point of today and doing this talk is, you know, I don't want to be a town councillor. I don't want to sit in those meetings. I don't want to be, be viewing and, and experiencing the misogyny. 
but I've got to conform to conform and so have we in some way because to get what we need to get the housing to get the communities and to get love and kindness back into politics and get the homes that people need we have to infiltrate the system and this picture people is me infiltrating the system and if you ever want any help or any guidance, you just want to talk to me, I need as many of you, as many of you as possible to infiltrate that system so we can get the housing and the communities that everyone deserves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. That, uh, that absolutely deserves a round of applause um, for that. And I've noticed people's faces smiling as they um, watch this. That's terrific. Thank you. I'll stop screen sharing now. So uh, I'm going to move now and um, turn to Alison. Uh, Alison Ward has been working for, I think, a couple of decades or possibly even more um, as a housing advisor for community led housing action. And she is a co-founder of Wessex Community Assets, which were the most incredible help to uh, our own CLT in Cheriton Bishop as we got started um, and to very many others. Alison, do you want to say a bit more about um, what you do and um, give us your talk, please? Yeah, sure. I've got some slides here as well. So just bear with me one sec. I'll try and get them up. So... Uh... Can you see that? Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. Um, so actually I'm co-founder of Middlemarch Community Led Housing and we worked for many years with Wessex Community Assets um, to deliver community land trust support, my colleagues and I. So, and then as time moved on and the projects got bigger and there got to be more community groups that we wanted to work with, we branched out on our own and set up Middlemarch Community Led uh, Housing. Uh, we mainly work in Somerset Dorset and Devon, these are all the places that we, we do work. So uh, on this map, the blue dots are where we've worked with community groups um, and they've established community land trusts and, um, and now they've got completed schemes um, under their belts. So they've got local people living in those, the homes that they helped to create. And the purple dots are where we're in the middle of working with the community groups somewhere along the process, because doing a, a, an affordable housing for local people scheme takes quite a long time. It takes, you know, on average, we've figured out about six years from start to finish. And there's lots of different th segments of it. Um, there's the setting up of the group, there's the looking for land, there's the negotiating with the landowner, there's the raising money to do your investigations into the land, uh, employ an architect, there's the applying for planning permission and negotiating all, all that there's finding a development partner or a housing association partner to build the homes for you setting up an allocation process that takes a long time so some of these dots have been purple for a long time um, and I just my, my specialism is helping uh, community groups set up community land trusts and that's their way that they um, tackle the housing crisis in their area so very briefly uh, what we do is set, help community groups to set up and not for private profit organisation that's set up to benefit a particular community that can own land and other assets which are reported to a community to help that community be sustainable into the future. Uh, crucially, it's a mechanism where communities can own assets, so they're available for future generations. They can't get sold off to right to buy, so they're always available for local people. And it's open for membership for anybody working in the community. And for some community, this community groups, this really resonates and it's a, a way that they can get the homes that they need for, or get some of the homes that they need for local people. Usually um, the reasons why people come to us and say they want an affordable housing scheme and can we help them is they want homes that are specifically prioritised for local people. They don't want people to come in from, you know, a long way away and take priority over homes that are built in the village or town. Um, they want social rents, they don't want affordable rents because local people just can't afford those very often. They want homes to be low carbon. They want homes to look great, to look really in keeping and to be locally supported because housing can be really divisive in communities and can pit neighbour against neighbour. But with a community led scheme, you're more likely to get an approach that more people in the community want and like and that looks good for that place and embodies all the values of that 
that place and with the best one in the world it's local people really that know what that is rather than an outside organization so my job and my colleagues job is to help community groups set up and and deliver that we find that the most popular way of doing this is to help a community group set up a CLT, work up a scheme, find the land, um, and then go into partnership with the housing association to build the homes. So we're also sys uh, system infiltrators in a way. We work within the system, but we tweak at the edges and push the boundaries wherever we can in order to help community groups to meet their aspirations. Um, in those kind of partnerships, the community group leads on the important decisions like where homes are going to be, how many homes there should be, what they're going to look like, what's the occupancy criteria for people that are going to live in there and, and then find somebody that's going to build their homes for them and the housing association supports in that way. And it's really popular. We find that where community groups want to do this and there's local volunteers that put the time and energy into working up a project in this way and then they go to the wider community and say look we need these homes, this is where we think they ought to be and um, what do you think that lots of people that's in that community support it? Because you wouldn't stand up in front of your friends and neighbours and suggest the development in that neighbourhood if you didn't think it was the right thing to do, um, which is, again, why local people are the best place people to uh, make those decisions. Um, so I won't go on any further. Actually, I have got some more slides, but I'm pretty sure my five minutes is probably running up. So, um, so that's just a very brief run through, and I'll go into a bit more detail in the workshop later on. Right, thank you so much, Alison. And um, it's a bit tantalising to know that you've got examples to show us with different mixes of house, different types of houses. But um, it's true that there will be opportunities for that in breakout. Um, so now we're going to move on to Prana Simon, who uh, Prana is also a community-led housing advisor, and um, she is also a parish councillor. Um, and um, in Harberton and a fellow of the School for Social Entrepreneurs, Prana. Hi, thank you very much, everyone. And um, yes, I just completed um, uh, a course with the social, um, School for Social Entrepreneurs and um, feeling very optimistic um, for the minute about this. Um, uh, this is a perfect segue with Alison because as a newly minted um, community-led housing advisor, um, I don't have the uh, same experience of working with larger groups, but I do have educational experience as an adult tutor. And um, the company, the Confederation for um, uh, Cooperative Housing, who trained me, um, I've been a volunteer um, in the housing sector now for about eight years. I started out as a uh, CLT director, a board member for a housing association, uh, neighborhood plan committee member, and um, now I'm a parish councillor. So I have found that, um, yeah, you do have to infiltrate some of these groups in order to be heard and to be seen. So thank you, Kay, for bringing that up. Um, I'm a social tenant and conversations across different stakeholders are very difficult sometimes. And um, my recent training as a CLH advisor and um, SSE entrepreneur um, have sort of come together now in this system um, that the CCH um, allows folks, I don't know if you can see from my screen here, but this is um, the online and the, um, the physical toolkit called WayShaper, which is focused on CLH, um, community-led housing uh, enablement, basically, allowing folks from all different walks of life to talk to each other using uh, a tool to basically get conversations going in a productive manner and continuing in that way. So if you wanted to show my slides, this is my, um, this is my intro information here. So next slide. This shows um, WayShaper as, so if we go on to the next one, yeah, there we go. This shows the basic outline of, you get a, um, a bunch of instructions. You get 16 priority cards, which help a group or a conversation focus on a topic. 
And then you get 70 options to work out in an algorithm what is most important in each priority. Um, then along with the option cards come more information uh, via a subscription to the website. If we go on to the next slide here, um, the purpose of all this would be to simplify, support and accelerate. Um, as you heard from Allison, that it can be a long process and sometimes people get stuck in the middle. Sometimes people get stuck in the beginning, just how to start. And as an adult tutor, um, really used to writing up lesson plans and schemes of work and action plans for students, it just seemed like a no brainer to me to have folks um, start to interface with this toolkit so that um, things could speed up. It does solve the tendency for people to think that, um, you know, community led housing scheme A over there in um, Torrington or something like that will work exactly the same in the South Hams, and that's not necessarily so. Um, so it helps you tweak your individual needs a little bit more and also understand your vision and your mission and how they work together. It also helps to um, work out any incompatibilities because there's so much information to absorb about community-led housing each step of the way that sometimes you can go down a route um, a good long way and realize that it doesn't compute. It doesn't actually, it's not compatible with something else that you had planned in the future. You've and, got a minute, Prana. Okay, thanks. And then the last thing is the neighborhood planning. Um, often, basically neighborhood plans get stuck in process. So it helps parish councillors in the long run. And here's a picture of Blaze here on the left. Uh, he's the creator, one of the creators, and uh, a workshop we recently held down in South Brent. And the next slide, both were, um, okay. And this just shows you how you can set up your priorities on the top left in the smaller photo. And if we go back just one. I'm just sorry. That's okay. And then you can take your options in a pyramid and start to whittle down some of your, um, your most important things to work on step by step. And this um, photo on the, on the right is just um, a little bit of a blow up of a process that you can go through with a priority. So it's, it's quite logical. It's, um, it's very helpful for people to get out of their emotions and sort of think in terms of, okay, next steps, action plans, and also breaking up the work amongst everybody so that it's fairly done. So I hope that that interests you and there's my information if it does. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Prana, that's, that, that's great a really helpful one and i can anticipate you might have a few more questions about that yeah. i'll leave it up for just a second so that you can um, see the details but we will be sharing the slides with participants afterwards so you should get this sure thing okay thank you i'll stop sharing now so i'm going to hand over now to erica erica travis has uh, been working very dynamically for some time on um, the uh, possibility of tiny homes. Erica, over to you. Thanks very much, Jill. And um, thanks, Roxy, as well, for inviting me here as a sort of non-professional, as it were. And I feel very privileged to be here and very excited, of course, like everyone else. I am referencing off another screen, so if my eyes go even more wonky than usual, I do apologise. Um, but just so I don't go over time, I've got a little presentation. So I'm going to spread, share my screen as opposed to spare my screen. Here we go. Share. So let's go to the beginning and let's look at um, the slideshow. In the beginning, if you don't mind. So tiny homes. Now, some of you in the room may not particularly have heard of tiny homes and so that whole point of the talk is to introduce you to my favourite subject. I am a complete tiny house addict and a tiny house bore, so thank goodness you've only got five minutes for me. And um, but basically, for those who 
even for those who do know, I mean, what is a tiny home? Do we have a definition? Short answer is no. And um, why on earth would you want to live in a tiny home? Well, these are going to be open ended questions and hopefully in the breakout rooms, we can explore those in a bit more detail. And um, especially the types of people who might choose to voluntarily live in a tiny house. And um, strange creatures, a bit like unicorns, but there's plenty of us, I assure you. So if we had such thing as a tiny home and we found the people to live in them, and um, the next question, of course, is where on earth would we put them? So Bristol are leading the way, and we'll come to that perhaps again later in the breakout room. And um, the where also be touched upon, I hope, by James Shorten as well. And how much is a tiny home? How much is a tiny home? Um, obviously, it's relative. It's a bit of a piece of string. Um, but the tiny home, just, just as an introduction, I see as a bit of a spectrum, ranging from um, perhaps a small bed sit, you know, right up to a self-contained um, tiny house on wheels, maybe. So it's more useful, perhaps, to consider the pros and cons while we're also reflecting on those questions. I'm not going to read these out. I haven't got time. It does look on the surface as if there might be more pros and cons, but maybe I'm biased. Um, Jill, will these slides be available for anybody afterwards? Yes, we hope to share them afterwards. OK, and I've obviously got them on my computer too. OK. Um, so yeah, some really nice pros about them. And obviously the main con, up until about an hour ago, I only had one con and that was the fact they were very small. Um, but obviously sort of, to be fair and unbiased, I've had to put a few more in there, even though I didn't want to. And um, this is um, an example of a tiny house. It's an eco tiny house. It's manufactured, um, not in Devon, I hasten to say, um, but I brought it down um, to the Bath and West show. And, it was quite a curiosity, it attracted an awful lot of attention. This is a typical interior. Um, a tiny home is on a very small footprint. Um, this one is on a trailer, the largest possible road legally towable trailer. So everything has to work really hard um, in terms of weight um, and design and materials, etc. You really have to see inside and step inside one to believe it. To call it a TARDIS would be to insult Doctor Who, and I wouldn't wish to do that. And um, yeah, the Bath and West show, the point was to bring the tiny house to the UK audience. And there are a group of us representing many, many hundreds of people um, connecting online mainly at the moment, um, who decided to, to go on that mission. So yeah, a group of us hosted the tiny house at the Bath and West show. We had a bit of a party, it was great fun and it can be done for unrelated adults, who knew? Next slide. Um, this is a manufacturer on the left. Um, his name is Chris. He builds them in his factory on his site up in <coughs> County Durham. Uh, as I said- One minute to go, Erica. Demand, yeah, a lot of attention. So we are looking, I say we in the larger sense of the word, to find a little space in which to showcase one permanently. I am in lots and lots of talks about people who might have such a suitable space. And these pictures all just um, speak for themselves. This was only open for three days. We want to find a site for 28 days and eventually a permanent site. So here's just some pictures for your delectation. Um, limited only by imagination. Um, they're a very unique um, um, offering. And I think for me, it's not about the complete lack of housing or the need for new housing, it's about um, smaller person housing and the blockages in the housing system and the tiny house to me speaks to all of those. Here's an interior. Oh my goodness. Oh, um, and then a couple of questions here, um, which perhaps we'll consider in the breakout rooms. Teambridge Council are on the case in terms of proposing a tiny house scheme it's on a self build basis. There are people on the case. Um, I'd be very interested if anyone's interested in talking to me in breakout rooms. So that's all. Watch the space. Thank you for watching the space. And uh, yeah, welcome to my tiny house universe. Thank you so much, Erica. That's intriguing. It's really great. And so for our last contribution in this session, I'm going to hand over to Jackie Carpenter. So um, Jackie is a Quaker and chartered engineer, and she's founded two and now going on to a third housing co-op and she also runs courses on how 
to uh, found and run housing co-ops. Jackie, over to you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so I live in Cornwall at the moment, but I'm looking to help people set up co-housing communities in, in the Southwest. Um, people are asking me all over England, even people in America, but, but um, I'm deciding to stick to Cornwall, Devon, maybe Dorset and Somerset as well. So I um, currently am experiencing homelessness, which is really good. It's all part of the experience because I've moved out of one community and we haven't finished purchasing the new property. So um, I may well be living in a tent next week. And also I built a tiny house with my own hands. So I've had a bit of experience there as well. So um, co-housing has the idea of having a community house, which is the co-house, the communal house, the shared house. And if you have a communal house, you can have smaller houses to live in. So you may have a house, your own private space may consist of just a bedroom and a bathroom, and you may go to the co-house for your, uh, to use the kitchen and to share meals or to play games in the living room. Um, so you may have more time out of your own private house but you need it well some people live in communes but this is not a commune you have your own private space where you can be yourself be by yourself and and um have the respect of other people that you won't be interrupted in whatever you're trying to do so it has a combination of privacy as well as communal living um so my my attitude to the whole thing is there's lots of farms and big houses out there for sale. You look on right move. If you enter something like properties between 800,000 and 2 million, there's dozens of them. And so you might think, well, that's out of the uh, possibility of most people, but actually it isn't. So I'm working as an individual. I'm not working for a, count, a, a community land trust or a council or anything. Um, but last year I saw a really good, well, the other people as well, we saw a really good property. So I phoned up the, uh, the mortgage company and I had 50,000 in the bank. That's, my, that's the amount of money I had at that time. So I phoned up the mortgage company and said, we'd like to have a mortgage loan of a million pounds. And he said, okay. So it's not impossible. You don't need to be anybody fancy. I said to him, I'm part of a group. We'll raise the deposit for the, for, you know, for the 30%. If you give us a million pounds, we can buy a property for one and a half million. And there's actually two ethical mortgage companies that are really keen on this. And they're almost falling over themselves, trying to give groups like ours um, mortgages. So you've got to provide the deposit. Well, where are you going to get that from? Well, you know, I had 50,000. I've had some money returned there. So I've actually got 200,000 of my own money. I could go and buy a one bedroom flat in Red Roof or somewhere, but I don't want to. I want to live on a farm or in a big place, a lovely place with lovely gardens and lovely things and share with people. If I put my money in and we have a mutual ownership system, I won't be an owner any more than the people who have no money at all. Um, that the deal is people who've got no capital will pay towards the mortgage and people who have got capital don't have to pay towards the mortgage, but we all share the ownership, we share the rights, we share the responsibilities so that the, there is a, an equality between all the people who live there. And why would anybody put their private money in? Because this is dependent on private money being put in. But well, the answer is I get a much better place to live in. I get all these friends to live with. I learn from them. I can share my skills and knowledge. So I think mutual ownership is the key. And that's why I'm working on co-housing. So, yeah, so the question is, why don't we or why don't you buy a big country house and a farm and move in and live there? Not build new stuff and not get planning permission for everything, just live there within what the permission entails. So I have this system, which I do on a course, which um, I've been doing this for 15 years now. And I have a whole set of papers about how to set up a company, what the uh, constitution needs to be like, um, how to set up um, governance, which, which explains how people do mutual, mutual decision-making. There needs to be a lot of um, 
willingness to do bonding with the other people. Otherwise, you can easily descend into hostility. So all of that I can talk about in a breakout room. So basically, you find a place, you set up a vision, you get the people, apply for a mortgage, and you move in. Last year, the one we did took eight months from when we decided to buy it to when we actually moved in and lived there. So it's also a quick a quick way of going forward if that's what you want to do. And some people don't want to do this at all. But if you want to have a co-housing community in the country, it can go forward quite quickly. Um, that's more or less your time. Have you okay. got anything else to so round off with? One sentence, which is I've been concerned about the climate crisis for 30 years. As I've been packing my boxes, I found a paper I wrote 30 years ago. And I actually feel that the whole notion of zero carbon and going forward to a sustainable future is unlikely to happen. And that's OK. Living through the last whatever few years of of humanity's existence is going to be great but we need to do really good things and live in nice places so i have a different take on let's save the future as to let's live in the present and have a good time <laughs> thank you very much jackie that's great do you do you want to put the link for your courses into the chat um in case people want to follow that up i'm sure it, there will be discussion on that in breakout groups um, and we also have a few minutes for a couple of questions before we go on to the next um, speaker. Um, if you are asking a question, you might find that if you use the reactions, at the, which is for me at the bottom of the screen, and you put your hand up, it'll zip you to the top of the screen where I can see you more easily. Um, but we will share any links that you give us in emails afterwards. So do we have any immediate questions for that, for that? You can also pop your hand up on the screen if I can see you and I'll try and keep an eye out. Looks like everybody's feeling very happy with what they've heard. Oh, V's got a hand up. V, sorry. Do you want to say what your question is? Hi there. Can you hear me OK? Yep. OK, excellent. Um, I love what Jackie said, I love what everyone said, obviously. Um, but I have a question about that because I also went to the Ecology Building Society AGM and they were really, really keen to support um, um, investment. They were, they were totally up for it. Um, so I wondered if once you've invested that, how would you extract your investment without um, subjecting the whole community to a risk is that inbuilt into your um your idea and your plans and your experience because I, I found somewhere i found four arms houses outside exeter um that were going at a really cheap price and i wanted to invest help invest in them as social housing but i found stags to be quite difficult um and then i kind of took it as far as i could and just left it, but I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to do something soon. So I can answer that briefly. Part of the governance systems that I've worked on for the last 15 years, and they're kind of mine, because nobody else, everybody else is just living in co-housing, whereas I've collected up the documents which make it possible. So we have a, an equity loan certificate for the person putting the money in, so you don't buy the house if you if there's a little house a tiny house even in the community you don't buy the house you don't lease the house you don't rent it you become part of the not-for-profit company that owns the whole thing and if you but you have an equity certificate just like a mortgage company has a charge on your house you have a charge on the tiny house if you want to move out you sell your equity certificate to a new person and that way you get your cash back and they move into the community and we've got this all documented so i'm I, you know i give all these papers away because i think it's a great set of stuff thank you and i'm going to move, move on um now so um james i'm going to hand over to you to talk a little bit more about some of the planning issues and give us some examples and just to James, I'm sure you'll say more about what you do, but um, 
James is a, a planning advisor and um, works full time for, um, I'm sorry, I can't quite remember the name of Geo, but I'm sure you'll tell us. Um, and he has enormous experience on advising um, unusual housing projects and situations. Over to you, James. Thanks, Jill. Um... I have just put the links I'm going to refer to in the in the chat and I'll I'll show them in a moment. Basically, I am a let me just share my screen. Okay. Yeah, so I'm a oh I can't see my top bar there. So um I'm a planner with about oh nearly 35 years experience in rural planning and sort of alternative planning. Uh, my day job is a company called Terra Geo, based in Totnes. We are planning consultants, eco designers, agricultural consultants, and green builders. My other day job is the Regenerative Settlement CIC, uh, which is basically, I'll talk a bit more about it in a bit, but trying to bring the One Planet Development uh, work from Wales, which I was heavily involved in, into England. And I just want to refer to this third link here. Um, for COP last year, I put a, an article on uh, planning the planning system and climate change and I'm going to do a, a rural successor article quite soon on LinkedIn so you can find it there some of those ideas I'll be talking about as we go along as well so that's that I um also planning advisor to transition homes top Ness, and like Jill a member of zero carbon task force um rural planning is a funny business um it's basically really restrictive um, and deals with the need for exceptional development only. And that's led us to a position where we are focused on delivering uh, the needs of rural communities. But in my view, including for housing, that has led us to a position where we have um, basically missed the idea of opportunity in rural areas and, and the ability to breathe new life and new blood into rural areas. Um, that's partly because of the system's focus on agriculture and forestry as the prime uses in rural areas. Um, but we have to factor in also the, the profound impacts of the rural housing market on rural areas as a whole. The high increases in prices, the failure to build enough affordable housing. We, we're expected to have something like a quarter of a million rural housing shortfall in, in England alone. The planning system's got weird little traps in it, like um, the need for affordable housing to be part of the development doesn't apply to schemes below 10 and most rural schemes are small and the limited and i don't mean this in any way condescendingly to other people talking but the limited effect of community-led housing it's it's important but it's, it's a very small contribution to a very big problem um so that the context of rural planning and meeting the needs of rural communities in my view is one of at least partial failure we then layer on top of that the climate and ecological emergencies. And for me, it, it brings to the fore the, the importance of rural areas that we've kind of missed. Um, we need, in terms of the response to climate and ecological emergencies, mass sequestration. And your ability to do that in urban areas is limited. We also need strong nature recovery. Now, it's no less important in, in urban areas, but the significant places for that to happen are in rural areas because they are degraded. Uh, in ecological and in landscape terms. Flood control, a lot of that needs to come from rural areas as well, and the way it changes the way we manage catchments. And local food systems are a massive part of um, the response to the climate emergency. All of us on this call here, about a third of our carbon footprint comes from food. That's half of it is transporting it, and the other half is the way it's grown. So if we can grow more agroecological food closer to where we live, we can cut a vast amount of our carbon footprints whilst improving our diet and well-being. And this whole idea, which thankfully has entered the carbon plan for Devon, of relocalization, and it's a, it's a sort of Schumacher idea, really, that we, we've come to get used to this whole notion of everything being really gapped out and, and um, long distance. But if we can begin to relocalize patterns of behavior, patterns of supply chains that immediately has enormous carbon benefits as well as local community and economic benefits. So rural areas are a sleeping giant in responding to all of that because urban areas can only do so much even though they contain 80% of the population. 
I just wanted to have a brief touch on the notion of landscape. I have a problem with landscape as a conservation-led idea, and I'll summarise it very briefly as in an obsession with the past rather than an obsession with the future. We need to pay reference to the past, but goodness me, do we have to be obsessed with our future because we are in trouble. And therefore, if we are obsessed with what it looked like in 1950, we're kind of missing the point that change is coming anyhow. So um, there's a really good book on the Post Carbon Institute's website called The Future is Rural. I'll say no more, the title says it all, but it's about the, the um, rediscovery of farming as, a, as, a, as an important issue for everyone. And bear in mind that in the UK, we only supply 20% of our fruit and vegetables and the rest is imported. And as far back as 1980, it was the other way around until um, the Tory government destroyed the Land Settlement Association. So what we see now is not normal. It's extreme in many ways. And it's extreme result of the particular economy we've been, economic model we've been following. In the paper on LinkedIn, I talk about the importance of transformative development. The idea that the new stuff we permit under the planning system is just a bit greener than the old is nuts. If we consider that actually we could permit something that's truly zero carbon and have the maximum impact from the stuff we now give planning permission for. Differentiating development is another concept I'm really interested in, which is there is a body of us, and I reckon it's five to 10% of the population who would jump into a zero carbon lifestyle now if it were available. So why isn't the planning system providing that? Because that would immediately take all those carbon footprints out of the equation. And also spatial strategy. To see rural areas as less sustainable than urban is, is a, just a set of spectacles. We need sustainability, though I don't like the term anymore, but we need zero carbon, one planet footprint or whatever, we need it everywhere. And therefore, if we need different forms of that for rural compared to urban, we need to investigate that rather than just assume rural is less sustainable than urban using that form. So the sorts of things I'm interested in and work on are land-based rural co-housing, uh, I've got a couple of uh, clients, one in Wales and one in on Dartmoor at the moment, who've done exactly what Jackie's talked about. They're buying a farm, they're setting up a co-housing community, but they also want to grow beyond the existing buildings. Uh, uh, just to be clear about that, I live in an intentional rural co-housing community, Bowden House, just outside Totnes. So um, this is my life in any case. I'm working for a couple of the tiny homes group. The One Planet Development um, policy in Wales was mainly my research and then I wrote the practice guidance with others for the Welsh Government. Uh, that's, the, that's the situation where if you can prove that you can mainly meet your own needs from the site, you can live on it in exceptional circumstances. And if we get more time to talk about that, I do, we'll do for uh, in the breakout groups. My company stands up for horticulturalists and is successful in getting them to live on their land. Small farms that traditional agricultural consultants don't see as worthy of a dwelling we believe it is the future. Small farms are the future, as well as the larger ones, of course. Uh, and then the similar applies to woodland stewardship. We have half the small woods in the UK are unmanaged, and yet they are, again, a, a, a just a lost opportunity. We can put stewards into those woodlands. The regenerative settlement CIC is basically formed on the idea of the way we do development at the moment, we put people on the land in ways that make the land worse. But that's just a way we do it. We could design human settlements so that it regenerated the land as well as providing livelihoods, energy, food, water, and so on for the people who live there and actually fully benefited both people and land. We just don't do it that way, but it's completely possible. And we know all of the different ingredients to that. We just don't put it all together and see what happens. So the regenerative settlement CIC is about trying to provide the toolkit to make that happen so the people who want to live like that don't have to also have a planning scrap because planning scraps are boring and that's my job instead of yours if you see what I mean <laughs> and all of this adds up to a, a more purposeful and diverse countryside which we're going to need it's a resilience issue you know change is coming anyhow and therefore and it will you know it will be profound for the countryside in terms of which species of tree grow which sorts of agriculture grow how we manage water and, and, and how we have the people in amongst that mix to look after it and, and gain the most out of it because we're going to need more from our countryside to support us so why Thanks, don't we Thanks. you've got a minute if it's multiple and positive benefits and that was my last sentence Jill. <laughs> 
Well done. I could I, I could hear some sort of mental cheering uh, going on as you were speaking about that. Thanks so much, James. Um, and I'm going to move straight on because uh, Roxy has some comments about live work options, which follow very neatly from what you were talking about. Um, Roxy, do you want me to go straight to your slides? Yes, please. Um, where are they? Um, so I just wanted to talk about a couple of um, different options for live work situations because, um, you know, we often think about housing as just a residential situation, but a lot of people need to um, need to be able to live near to where they work. So I don't know if this, this slide has come up yet, but um, I can always I can send you the slides in the chat and just talk about it if, if that's not working. Um, they're not they're not particularly informative anyway they're just nice pictures um so so I don't, uh, so there's um an organization called the ecological land co-op who have a, a very interesting model um and i I'll, I'll share um i'll share a video with you um, um just exploring this further in, in the email so the mission of the Ecological Land Co-op is to provide affordable opportunities for ec ecological land-based businesses in England and Wales. Um, and they support rural re regeneration uh, by developing sites for farming, forestry and other viable rural enterprises, which also uh, benefit the environment. Um, their aim is to share land more equally amongst the population, therefore helping revitalise rural communities by making land, food and jobs accessible to all. And they also seek to address the historic concentration of land ownership in England and Wales by campaigning for po policy change. Um, so their solution and core business plan is to create small clusters of affordable residential small holdings. Um, they work out with tenants to gain planning permission to build um, low impact dwellings and provide infrastructure such as barns and water supply. Um, they, um, they're, they're, um, that holding at Green and Reach in Devon has been so successful that um, some of their, their businesses that were there are now moving on to larger properties. So, so they are not sure if they still have any um, spaces available, but they did recently put a call out for um, for people to apply to live on their one of their sites. Um, they buy up bits of land and get donated land so that these bits of land are you know there forever for for these communities to um, live and work. Um, affordable agriculture and woodland worker dwellings um, near, near to where they work is a huge issue and there's been a sharp decline in these in the last several years with rural dwellings which were once um, you know once affordable dwellings becoming luxury cottages and apartments I'm sure you've seen this um, all around the, the places that you work and I was recently at a land workers alliance gathering for woodland workers and you know there are so many people concerned about this they they just some of them are having to live in awful conditions um just to be able to manage the woodland which we 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 desperately uh, need to be managing um so another issue is affordable dwellings for care workers um so some people are getting to come up with novel live work situations where people are clubbing um together to buy a property to retire in um, with extra space for living carers um, there are I've heard of all kinds of, of novel situations where people want to be able to um, there's a there's a, a place up north where they're doing a housing co-op so that they can have people um, some young people live there and work with them and care for them um, and so they can have really loud music because they don't want to be you know in their words stuffed in a care home and being told to turn their music down they want to they want to be able to live in a way in which is is beneficial to them so there are there are there are lots of creative ways to um uh to be solving the housing crisis that include work and um, be great to hear hear if there are any other ideas for that um going forward so that's all for me <laughs> i'll uh, hand over to for questions now if anyone has any questions for James or comments. Thank you, Roxy. That's great. I'm looking out for um, people raising their hand either physically or um, using the um, raise your hand facility at the bottom of the screen. Um, 
Yes, Graham, um, do you want to say what your question is? You need to unmute. Hi, I'm Kian, I'm Graham's partner. Um, and I primarily want to ask James Shorten if you would if you would work, if we could just employ you as a, as a planning consultant for, because we're starting this project, we call it the Common Ground Project. Um, and we are basically gifting land um, into a kind of tiny, like mobile off-grid tiny house agri-hood. Uh, we want, we've got a 47 acre site, although we're meeting considerable local resistance. Um, and the idea is to have a, the, the layout to be kind of agroforestry corridors. And it, everything you said, James, was like uh, every single thing was like, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, everything about the relocalization, about everything about this live work notion. It's like, how do we create spaces where people can can live meaningful landed lives um, and models? Yeah, like the OPD does exist. But yeah, we're, we're kind of in the process of trying to create something which doesn't doesn't really exist yet. And yeah, we need all the help we can get. Um, and so yeah, I'm just putting us. I'm just putting us out there. It'd be really great if if you're up for it, James, to to talk more because I think you would, your insight would be invaluable to the the journey that we're on at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really, I don't even really have a question. I go, how, how do you like? Yeah, the, where you work for? Where you work for us? <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, because we're all part of a movement that's trying to achieve the same thing. Um, and I'm sure the, the wealth of projects we've worked on would help. So um, I'll stick my email in the chat. OK. <laughs> this, this sounds like there's a lot more to say. So I'm going to uh, move us on now. And in a minute, we're going to have a little uh, comfort break. But I'm just going to tell you a word about what you'll find when you get back. So when we return, you will have a choice of breakout groups um, and you will be able to um, hopefully yourself select which group you want to go in, depending um, which of our speakers you um, most need to follow up with. Um, so, yeah, inspired by author and changemaker Rob Hopkins, founder of the Transition Network. So you may have heard of the Transition Towns that started in Totnes. It's a global movement of communities coming together to reimagine and rebuild our world. So let's begin with some questions to help us imagine. What if citizens and decision makers in Devon, in everything that they did, acted as if this were a housing emergency? What if everyone in Devon had access to rural housing they could afford to pay for in the places they grew up, near their family and support networks, and near the places that they work? The answer to these questions can be answered in many, many ways. Indeed, we've heard some of the answers this evening. And we also know that these questions must be answered within the context that any housing um, must adapt right now to the impact of climate change. And that the ecological emergency due to, the, um, due to be catastrophic if we do not turn things around. So a quote from Rob Hopkins is, I think the thing with imagination is that if we are to create a world in which we can thrive and survive, we have to be able to imagine it first. So in this exercise, there are two rules. The first is that you must not be constrained by current thinking. So don't think, oh, but will this fit into our current budget plans? Will this fit into our five-year development strategy? None of that. We need a clean slate, big ideas. And the second rule applies, especially when we head out into our breakout groups. The rule is, when someone comes up with an idea, no one is allowed to say yes, but you can only respond by saying yes and. Um, right. So I'm going to pre quickly press play on my video. So the invitation is for you to get yourself comfortable and for you to close your eyes and take a breath. And in a moment, I'm going to turn on my time machine. And when we turn on the time machine, what we're going to do is we're going to travel forward from 2022 forward to 2032. And the time that we travel through, the years that we travel through, have been a time of the most profound and extraordinary change and shift, which in 2022 felt almost unimaginable. 
but we could just glimpse different pieces of it and what it might be like. But what happened in subsequent years was that there was a cascade of positive change. It wasn't all easy, but things started to move and things started to shift. And it was a time that people who came afterwards look back to as an extraordinary time in history, as a revolution of the imagination. They sing great songs and tell great stories about the incredible work that people did during that time. So when we turn on the time machine, I'd like you to imagine that you were kind of lifted up from 2022 and then gently dropped down into 2032, which is not utopia. It's not perfect, but it is the result of everything that could possibly have been done, being done. And when I turn on the time machine, you'll hear some sounds that will help you with that. And when we get there, we're just going to sit through a few minutes and just allow yourself to go for a walk in your imagination around that space. What does it smell like? What does it feel like? What do you see? What do you hear? How does it feel quantitatively different from where you will co have come from? So now I'm going to turn on my time machine and we will take about four minutes in silence just to go for a walk around. <laughs>
Okay, so welcome back everyone to 2022. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to put you into breakout groups and just take a minute each um, to share any key reflections, key observations and key things that you felt or saw or experienced. And we'll just have a sharing of how that experience was for you. And then we'll see you back here in a few minutes. Um, we'll also um, have some opportunity for you to share your ideas and actions um, for solving the housing crisis in Devon, um, or at least a small part of that. Um, or it might be some ideas and actions for, for steps that you might like to take in your own life um, or your own uh, community project. Um, so please remember the two rules. First is that you should not be constrained by current thinking um, when sharing your vision. And the second rule is that when someone comes up with an idea, no one is allowed to say yes, but. You can only respond by saying yes and. Um, by using yes and instead of yes, but, you can build off each other's ideas rather than constraining them during this imaginative process. It will make me happy. <laughs> It's full of, our 2032 is full of mad bricks. We've reduced the fear, if not eradicated it completely. We have lots and lots of planners. We have anarchy, we're anarchists. We have loads of tiny homes for everyone to live in, shared communities, shared land. We're all radical and everything is radical. And we've shut down Airbnbs, but we haven't crashed the economy. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, Donna, did you want to share? I'm not sure I can follow that. Actions? Uh, one <laughs> to flee. But there you go. Um, it was it was more. Um, our Amy came up with something brilliant in our group about planners and how they can be so often demonised. But um, but I was I suppose I wanted to share. She had so many wonderful insights about how and what the planners uh, may need planning to to help. Um, future, with our future and what it might look like and I just wondered if Amy would probably be, be able to speak about it a lot better than I but it was just so important what she was saying I wondered if Amy may I invite you is that really naughty or are you up no, for that? No it's fine I don't mind um, thank you uh, yeah well I was just because I mean I've done lots of research on um, planning and uh, sustainable development and the politics of planning and, and all those kind of things and I've been a neighbourhood planning advisor, um, helps set up community land trusts, um, helps set up community energy groups, my community, lots of things um, like that. And so, you know, I've interviewed quite a lot of planners and, you know, they, one of Donna, I think it was saying, you know, that saying, well, what, what do planners need? Do they just need more boxes to think of a tick? I think that's what she said. Um, and I was going to say, the last thing they want is more tick boxes. They're fed up of it. You know, they, they don't want to just have a process where, you know, oh yeah, participation yes we're going to do tokenistically you know they they do genuinely want a lot of them really really want to be on the side of the community and they want to help but they just like got so little capacity um that they are often just you know firefighting um and doing the very very basic um uh, that they you know the essential things that they can and even that because they're so under resourced they're not getting permissions through and so some things are getting through within this eight week period um when you know because they don't have the capacity to do that and so you know the thing that needs to happen is that they are more resourced and they're also um empowered because you know that so that the process is more fluid the participatory process is more fluid the relationship between the neighborhood plan which is trumped often by the um you know, the local plan, which is then trumped by national policy, all this kind of like hierarchical policy architecture um, needs to become a lot more fluid and adaptive. Um, and just the time scales that kind of put on stuff like, you know, you need to review a local plan every five years. I mean, yes, of course, things need to be reviewed, but it's just, it just kind of puts a lot of pressure on the system and the process and everybody gets just too process driven when there's just a lot more potential for collaboration that's just not happening because of the way the planning system works. Jill, did you have something? Thank you, Amy. <laughs> yeah, just very briefly, we had totally contrasting visions, one of a rural 
place where people were walking free and you couldn't actually see any houses and one of a an urban area where there were mass there were trams so people didn't need cars and there was masses of space in the streets for gardens energy generation kids playing and now i'm just seeing in chat prana what you've put for 15 miles an hour traffic it would be great and one of the things that is possible i think is low traffic neighborhoods and urban places that have tried them really seem to like them um you know we had somebody from waltham forest saying that neighborhoods that didn't have them after a while they saw how good they were and they wanted them so there's a big controversy about that in exeter and uh, yeah decent public transport would make a lot of things possible in the cities i just thought i'd feed that back that's fantastic thank you um i would really love to hear if anyone has any actions that they um that they want to take forward so that's going to be individual actions or actions they would like for the whole of Devon please or for your um sort of immediate area please do put that in the chat and we will um we will save that and we'll put it into a into a blog or a report afterwards and and sort of reflect that back to um to the people of Devon to, to have a read um, Maybe um, Adam would like to say a little bit about the Stir to Action Festival coming up. That might be an action. Yes, yes, do do go ahead and, and share that. Yeah, very happy to, to say that we've got the Stir to Action um, playground for the New Economy Festival, which is three days of talks midweek, Tuesday to Thursday, uh, 12th, 13th and 14th of July um it's a it's kind of a conference with a festival theme we've gone heavy with festival theme this year so lots of like nice music um and a bar in the evening um but yeah lots of really important talks and there's particularly there's a community-led housing talk um from um simon um who has focused on student-led community housing um and that is on the tuesday and we've for 25 pounds and we're doing cheap tickets for 95 for the three days as well um, and you can come and stay and camp and that's all at Selgar's Mill. And Selgar's Mill's in uh, Mid Devon so not too far for a lot of you and it's an, it's such a beautiful site I, and just amazing amazing people to connect with and um, collaborate with so yeah I re totally recommend that. <laughs> Um, oh, and whilst I've got the floor as well, I, I really, really, really want to hold an event exactly like this, but in person at Selgar's Mill, um, perhaps in the autumn. It might have to be next year, but if anyone's got any energy for helping me organise that, then that's what I need more than anything is, is energy and time. So um, yeah, get in touch with me if that's something you've got. <laughs> yes, and also for some funding to help that happen. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've sort of um crafting a form to people to fill in to to just share whether they want to help organize that event um and also if they have anyone knows of any funding opportunities um to help fund that then then please do let us know <laughs> um so in the chat i've just shared a whatsapp group we would love it if you would stay connected um stay connected with us and with each other uh to help you with your um groups um or, or campaigns or whatever it is that you feel like you want to take part in going forward um and i'm sure some of the facilitators here today uh, will be sharing some of the courses they've got coming up as well um so yeah please do please do uh contribute to that as well um and just before we go uh i which would like to say a huge thank you to our partners on this program. So this is part of the Supply and Devon Shared Prosperity Program, which is part of the Devon Social Entrepreneurs Program. So this is funded by the UK Community Renewal Fund, um, led by the School for Social Entrepreneurs. Um, and our partners on this have been uh, Stir to Action, who did the Founders for a Future Program, and also Devon Communities Together, um, who are, have, still have some workshops coming up, I believe, um, around funding and, and, and some one-to-one -one support, the social enterprises, co-ops, et cetera, that, uh, that want to address um, things like community housing, um, food and health and well-being. 
Um, so please do keep an eye out for our email with um, more information about all of the things that you've heard today. And um, yeah, a huge, massive thank you to our speakers who, who have been so inspiring. And I, I, I do hope that um, we'll have more, more opportunity if there is a, a future event with you in it um, to, to speak further. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to keep the Zoom room open for now. If anyone wants to chat for a little bit longer um, beyond the allotted time frame, <laughs> um, a huge thank you. Thank you very much, Roxy, for the uh, energy that you've put into it. Um, well done, everybody. I think this place is sprouting with ideas and I look forward to seeing many of them blossom.